So first, uh, I want to say thank you for Jane, to, to Jane and Jill for, uh, for, this, for creating this uh, forum. Um, it's really uh, wonderful. And it's wonderful to be here in person uh, after two years of COVID where we actually communicated through screens. So I really appreciate this moment to be here uh, with you all. And I want to thank Rodolphe, merci Rodolphe, grazie Rodolphe, for organizing this this uh, this 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 day for me. Uh, I had really wonderful meeting this morning, and I look forward to the other one this afternoon. So I'm not going to talk about the robotic <laughs> uh, thing. What I'm going to talk about is something that I um, started to think about about 20 years ago, and. Um, when I started on this, I didn't think it would take me that far, but it took me on a long journey that I'm gonna to try to present uh, to you today. And this is about perception and action and how this is actually, could be a, a useful framework to understand development. So I'm gonna start with perception and action. So we're gonna start with perception and action and uh, we'll start with a slide, which probably is, is something that most of you are familiar with. Uh, perception and action was brought you know, by Judy Gibson and by a number of other people afterwards, and it's usually represented this way with this loop. Um, and so we know that this is really essential for our exchanges in our daily life. We perceive and act in our environment, but it's also super important for learning and development. And the idea of learning and development here is captured by the repetition in this loop. Um, so there is a very strong interdependence of perception you know, being used to guide action, but action also can feed back into perception, update the system and so on. And so this is where the learning really comes in. And um, when I started to look at this problem, um, I would find a lot of literature that would focus on this part of the loop where perception actually leads to action, but I wasn't able to find a lot of the literature that looked at how action actually feeds back into the perception. And this is really the part that I really wanted to, to examine in infants because I think this is where the updating actually takes place. This is how infants learn from acting and what they're learning you know, can be reused for their, next, um, for their, their ne next action. So I just want to illustrate that with a very simple cartoon to get us started when you use one or two hands for picking up objects. So imagine that you, know, you want to move this little pot of flour um, somewhere else. And so you first make an estimation based on, based on vision. It looks small. And so you will start to reach for it with one hand. And then when you reach it, you realize it's much heavier than you anticipated. You might lose it. And so you will bring your second hand uh, just to secure uh, this, this object. So you already have updated in the course of the action. Same thing if you start with a big object, which you may anticipate that it's, it's big, so you need two hands for it. And then as you realize that it's very light, you might release one handle uh, and use the other hand to carry something else uh, with the other hand. What I want to illustrate with this example is just a few, a few important things. First is that the initial action prediction that you make about object that generally based on visual information, they can change after you touch the object and after you manipulate the object. That as adults, we learn from this object manipulation, we remember their outcome, and we rely on these perceptual experiences to plan or modify your action in the future. And generally in adults, it takes about one trial to make that change. So if you want to go back and move the flower pot again, the next time you will do it with two hands because you remember that you almost lost it the first time. The other thing that is suggested by those examples is that the perception actually looks is actually a lot more complicated than just perception and action. There are a lot of steps in there that actually matter in, in our exchange with the environment, which I illustrated here. So for reaching, you know, you look at the object, you reach for it, you touch, you grasp, you manipulate, but at every point in time, you actually pick up novel information that is going to be useful to try to build up into your next action planning. So the idea of learning and development as it unfolds through repeated experience of seeing, reaching, touching, grasping, and manipulating, this is where each of those cycles contribute to gaining new information about an action, an object in environment, and lead to updating, refining the perception action match between the actor and the environment. 
And what you have here is really some multi-sensory motor integration, where all those levels did need to come together uh, in order to learn and fine tune our behavior. So this is really what I see as the process of change. All those things matter. I studied infant reaching for many, many years. I did uh, some locomotion studies as well, but reaching has always been my, my favorite subject of study. And when you look at infants, when they manipulate objects, they do a lot of things. They touch them, they, they bring them to the mouse to explore them, they, they manipulate in varied ways, and they do that a lot. They do that constantly throughout their, their life, really intensely. And so what do they learn from those experiments, of those, those, those exploration? And you know, are those exploration really mattering in their ability to, to figure out how to better plan their next action? So this is what I wanted to do when I started to this, to try to understand a little bit more how those different steps come in through those repeated experiences and to see how this experience would increase the perception action match uh, in those infants. At the time when I started on this work and I surveyed briefly the literature, very few studies were looking at the whole cycle the way I define here. There were a number of studies looking, as I said before, at seeing and reaching and how the planning, you know, based on visual information actually happens, or some were focusing on touch and grasp and seeing how the touch was informing infants, how to um, shape their grasp for objects, but really nothing was going on beyond the grass to look at manipulation. And so I wanted to integrate all those levels to see how that works. So one of the first experiments that I did was to present uh, infant with objects of different sizes to see how they would adjust their reaching pattern from one to two hand as those objects would change in their, in their size. So uh, we had a series of objects uh, that we presented an increasing and decreasing order following a staircase procedure. So for example, if we started with the large object here uh, and the infant would reach with two hands, we went down for a few objects down, presented the object again, let's say they reach with two hands again, and then two hands again. And at some point you would expect the infant would switch to one hand. And when that happened, I just presented the intermediary um, uh, sizes just to see where the switch would happen. We also presented object with compounds. The reason for that was to have a better idea of how they use touch um, to modify the response. So if you look at those large compounds, they look big visually, the, you would expect they would reach for them with two hands, but once they manipulate, they can easily hold them with one hand. And so we were wondering how they would use that information to be able to switch and grab the next, the next large compound just with one hand. In all those, um, trial, we let the infant manipulate the object afterwards to see what they would do, how they would explore those objects, uh, if they would bring them to the mouse, or you know, what they would do with them in order to see how that would also sort of fill in this, this cycle in repeated trials. So we found that there was an age effect, which is not very surprising with infants as they get older, they get better. Um, but that was not the most interesting result in this study. The most interesting result was actually linked into the history of a motor response that those babies were providing at the different ages. So I'm gonna show you a lot of graphs and I'm gonna walk you through those graphs. They will look like this. So here's for the solid object when we started with a small to the larger one or from the larger to the smaller one. So here are the ball sizes as they increased or decreased in size. Here is actually whether they reach for it with one hand or two hands. And the dots here, the black dot are actually the reach pattern, two hand or one hand, um, or, the, uh, or the grasp that was performed also as well. So in this example, the object was small. You can see this infant that's a nine months old, reach with one hand and grasp with one hand. Did the same thing for the second object, second bigger size. And at, at a given size, this baby switched to two-handed reaching and maintained it. So here we have a very nice scaling of the motor response to the increase in the object size. And you can see going down, same infants actually did the scaling the other way as well. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a lot of this graph. Um, here is a group of infants. We call them the consistent scalers because if you look at all those images, those, those pictures, here they go up and here they go down. And even interestingly, let's say at subject 904 right here, you see these infants reaching and grasping with one hand, reaching and grasping for the next size as well. And here the baby is reaching with one hand, but now grasping with two hands. 
And on the next object, the baby reach with two hands and grasp with two hands. Here we have an update of the response, just like I was illustrating before that. Not all babies did it, but you, you have that pattern there. Not all infants were responding in this scaled manner. Here you can see a group of infants, we call them the inconsistent scalers, just because they seem to adapt the response one way, but not the other. Or they did it this way, but not that way. And so they seem to be doing well in one direction, but then they didn't do well in the other one. And you can see, if you look at those numbers, those are the ages, they're a little bit of everything. So they're mostly nine months old here, and there is a nine months old here, but it's, it's actually was ranging different ages. Last group was those babies that did not scale at all their response. They seemed to use a stereotypical response, no matter what the object size was. They seem to use either two hands throughout, like here, or one hand, like subject 601. And so there was no adjustment whatsoever as the object were changing in size. To examine how those patterns you know, affected the response with the compounds, we used those categories, those group of response, to examine what they would do in the compounds or the soft objects. And here, we let them manipulate the first object so they could get a feel for the texture. And we would see from the second presentation if they would start to make the adjustments. And so here are three groups, the non-response scalar, the one that were inconsistent and consistent. And you can see that the, no, the one who didn't respond or didn't scale, like here, didn't really adjust their response for the, for the soft object either. For the inconsistent, they didn't as well. And only the, the one who actually started to, the one who were consistent with the solid object started to actually show uh, some adjustment uh, with the compounds. But it was not really that great. How did they manipulate those objects afterwards? So everything I told you so far is actually looking at this aspect of the loop as they reached, as they touched, as they grasped, but what about the manipulation? So we found that the infants were holding the component in hand significantly more than the solid object, which makes sense, it's so easier to grasp, um, but there was no effect of age groups. Regardless of the strategy they were using, they would all show a one-handed grasp on those objects after the reach after the grasp. When they had the object in hands, the infant brought the object to the mouse way more than with the solid object than they did with the compounds. And again, there was no effect of group. So it seemed that all infants, even the young infants, were sensitive to those textual differences. They held the compound more and the mouse, the solid one more, but these responses sensitivities did not seem to uh, transfer to the next cycle or the next presentation. So it seemed that the manipulation were happening in the moment, they were adapting the response in the moment, but they didn't seem to be used to carry on onto the next response. So it seemed that the link here was broken. So when we did this first study, we said, well, maybe by varying the sizes of the object makes it difficult for those infants. What about if we present to the same experience over and over? And so we did a second experiment where we presented objects of the same sizes. So infants were presenting this either with small object or large object, and to decide which size they would be given, we actually probed them. So if a baby was responding by manually during the probe, we gave them the small object to see how they would switch after repeated reach to the small object if they would switch to one, one hand. And vice versa, if babies were actually reaching with one hand, we offered them the big one to see if they would switch to the larger one. And, and all group received the large compounds again to examine their, their haptic, use of haptic information. Okay, so the result here presented a little bit differently because what I'm showing here is the response match. So whether they were presenting with a large or the small object, we looked how many of those responses were matching the object size. So if I presented a small one, I was looking for how many responses did I go for it with one hand, right? But if I presented the large one, I looked at how many of those responses were two hands. So there's just the response matches. And you have these four reaching in black and grasping in gray. And we had an age effect uh, for the reaching actually was due mostly for these eight months here that did something different. For the graph, you can see it was getting a little better with progression over time. For the compounds, we actually lost the significant effect um, altogether, um, as you can see here. And we looked at mousing again, and here again, we're finding 
a very strong difference that those babies were actually um, mousing the solid object way more than they did for the, the compounds, which we had in our prior studies. So this study actually, um, when we're trying to ask, ask the question if they adapt the response better when the task is providing more of the same sensory for motor experience, our answer was like, not really. We didn't get better results by presenting the same object. So I wanna say here in something like that adult, you know, would do it in one trial. Here they had 10 trial and they still were not doing really, really good at it. So um, this data in a way was providing further evidence that young infants are not using prior sensory information very well uh, to plan and shape their future reaching and grasping responses. And so that led us to the next question. So maybe what's happening here, it's I should look at the beginning of the, of the, of the cycle. You know, are they really paying attention to these object properties? Maybe they're not looking at them very well. The touch, they're not very good. So you, there is not a very good integration. So that led to a completely different line of research that involved eye tracking because I wanted to really have some impact, in, you know, insight on on what those babies would, would, would pay attention to. And I'm gonna give you just a very small piece because this, this, this would take us you know, sort of in a, in a different track. Um, and I wanna sort of put that also in the context. I'm just gonna step aside for a moment to tell you a little bit about what we know on, on seeing and reaching very briefly. Um, when you think of reaching in infancy, that's really the first moment in life where Visual attention directed toward an object is actually also linked to an action that is also directed toward an object. You can see the look, the hand, everything is actually tuned toward that target or that goal. When emergence of reaching occurs, this is also an important transition in those babies because before they live in a world where they look at objects, but they don't reach for them. And when they start to reach, they actually kind of have access to a completely new new world of senses, right? They can, they can actually touch the object, feel the texture, bring them to the mouse. So there are clearly a lot of things that are happening there, but we don't know much, again, how those things are integrated. So a lot of what I'm gonna do on the, on the eye tracking is going to be looking at this part of the, of the, of the relationship, of, the, of that loop. We're gonna look at seeing, reaching and touching because I'm gonna focus mostly on the transition between before and after reaching. So how do we know, what do we know about how infants learn to reach for objects? And I have to go back to my first hero in psychology, Jean Piaget, who got me in this field, um, because he was one of the person who actually really influenced the field in big ways. And he actually put out one of the longest held assumption about learning to reach that actually was based on how, um, based on the fact that infants needed to look at their hands to guide them to the desired object uh, location. So the idea, so according to Piaget, was that the object is here, the infant need to look at the object, they need to look at their hand and step by step, they guide their hand there. So it's a really top down kind of learning process where the mind so how is guiding the, the, the body. But this idea of visually guided reaching has been sort of questioned uh, in the later, later years. Uh, Clifton et al, for example, they've shown that infant can actually reach in the dark when they actually have no vision of their hand and they could actually intercept the target. And even later work I done with, done with Esther Thielen when I was a postdoc in a lab, and we found that a lot of the trajectories that are not straight, when babies start to reach, they do a lot of uh, um, distortion in trajectory were not actually linked to visual guiding, but they were linked to um, a poor ability to, to modulate or calibrate the speed of the movement so that it would drag their movement away from trajectory and they would have to correct. And so that was not linked to vision. It was, it was all happening um, you know, during the movement online and mostly based on proprioception. So when you look at this picture, the question remains, you know, how does visual motor mapping and which onset emerges? We don't know much about it. And so if we figured, okay, if we do the eye tracking, maybe we can get some insight into this. So we started with uh, three infants that we followed weekly uh, for the entire first year of life. And here I'm just gonna give you a very short piece of that developmental story that actually is focused on the five weeks before they began to reach and five weeks after. And we collected eye tracking on the object during those five weeks. 
And after in the paradigm that you can see here, so here was the eye tracker, um, there was a curtain. So after the DSRW was calibrating, uh, calibrated, the, the, the curtain was closed, it would open revealing an object held by your hand and the object would held, be held out of reach for five to seven seconds. And the reason for that is because of very slow encoders, we wanted to make sure they would have time to observe the object, look at it before it would be brought into their, their reaching space. And then we looked at where they reach. And so the question was clearly how does coordination between vision and arm occur prior to, at or during, uh, during or after each onset? Uh, do the eyes after staring at the object dictate where the hand should go? So that's a question of visual selection. And if so, do we see a spatial match between where they looked and where they reach? Are they getting to the same place? Okay. I'm gonna show you um, first a couple of videos of how that happens, because I always find those babies when they're learning to reach one of the most fascinating developmental <laughs> phenomena. But I'm gonna show you this because this is where um, the idea that babies develop different sensory spaces before they start to reach sort of came about. So here you'll see this baby. This is actually the first week that this baby, 15 weeks old, actually made his first contact with the target. On this first um, video, the baby does not make contact, but what you'll see is actually quite interesting. So here's the eye tracking. And as I said, we're maintaining, maintaining the object out of reach for five to seven seconds. We're trying to collect five seconds of looking at the object. Right? And when they're young, they, they pick fixation outside of the target, as you can see. But you can see the infant is quite focused. I mean, it's really looking. And one typical behavior that you see at this stage, their hands are clutching together. This was actually described by White Castle and held in 1964. And this clutching, sometimes they bring him to the mouth. And what happens, you can see the baby is looking at the object very intensely while they're touching their hand, when they bring him to the mouth. And in a way, they get all the sensory information they need to have. They get visual information, they have touch, but they happen in different spaces, right? The vision is on the object, the touch is on the body. So you may think, well, the baby really wants the object, but I really, I don't know <laughs> if they want the object. You know, it's they're looking at it and they're doing things. They're, they're really actively doing things with their hands, but they're, they're not connected. So this is where this infant did his first contact with the next object. Oops, no, that's not what I want to do, this one. So we use the different object for this task. This one was a cup, it just happened that the cup was the first object that he touched. You can see the clutching again. And typical of those very young babies, they're, they're, they're not so focused on the target either. It gets better as they get older. So again, they see vision, they get touch, they bring them to the mouse, which is something they want to do. And then you'll see the hand move forward and the touch. So I'll show you more videos of what happens when this happens in those babies, because I think this is a key moment in the transition to reaching. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But when you see this, you don't know if it's intentional or not. Again, it's, it's really hard to tell. But what we found, I need to tell you about this data because they were really mind, mind boggling and uh, I'm still trying to wrap my head around. So I'm gonna tell you the way I understand it at this point. We actually following, we have followed five more babies because we wanna see if we can replicate this data. But what we learn here is the sort of the take home message where we learn is that infants do not visually guide their arm. When you saw that on the video, the baby was not looking at their hand. The eyes were right on the object. What we found is actually they learned to align vision to the reaching response. So in a way, it's like taking the story and rotating the other way. It's not vision guiding the hand, it's almost like the hand guiding vision. So how did we get to that uh, conclusion? I'll show you just one of the objects that we used in this task and we compared to nine months old. So I'll, I'm showing you first like a nine months old typical response right here. This is in slow motion. So you'll see the, the eye tracking here first and then you will see how um, they, uh, they, they respond with the reach. And hopefully that will go. There we go. 
So on this object, typical, they look at the two sphere. And in this case, you can see the baby just sort of ended up at the center and grasped at the center. The nine months old actually match fairly well their looking pattern to their reaching pattern. So let's look at those young infants starting to reach. Uh, so these are the three babies. And uh, this is the reaching response first. And these are the weeks. So reach onset is back here. And these are the five weeks following. Here are the nine months old response. So you can see a little bit how they compare to that. And to do this analysis, we looked at where the infant touched first the object. And so this is the sphere, the middle, and the, and the end of the rod in this case. I just want to mention that those objects were presented in all directions. So they were rotating. The sphere was not always on the right. It actually could be at the bottom, at the top, and so on. So we collapsed the data here because there was no difference in, in, uh, in, in orientation. So what you see in those babies are more of those brown bar than the other one. In fact, those babies touch significantly more the sphere of those objects than any of the other area of the object. And the nine months old do that also. You can see it's right here. In fact, there was no developmental pattern, no development change. They were from the first time they actually contacted the object, they went to the sphere more than any other part on this object. So when you look at this picture, you say, oh, for sure, vision must have been there because that's where they brought their hand. Remember, these are young babies. Their visual manual control is not so well established. And when you look at what happened on the eye tracking, uh, we found something a little bit uh, surprising or unexpected. So here you have more data because I said we, we were recording the eye tracking five weeks before reach onset. So reaching is right here. And then we have the five weeks after when they started to reach. If you look at the period before, the looking pattern is more distributed. Like here, they look almost equally uh, to those two objects. Same thing here. We, we couldn't, we had missing data for these infants. Or this one looked more in the middle than this sphere. But this is where the developmental changes were significant. And I'm just highlighting them with those bar. After they started to reach, those babies started to increase their looking at the sphere over time, over the five weeks. And they decreased their looking at the middle part of the object. And so it looked like the change that occur in time happened in vision, but not in reaching. It happened as if vision was aligning to the motor pattern and not the reverse. In fact, I think what happened is that in those five weeks, those baby learned to become more predictive in their reaching and more selective. But still that was led from the motor response. At least that's what I can say right now. So, Coming back to the perception action framework that I started with, I think there are a few things that are happening when infants start to reach first. I think this is the first time where those two sensory space I was telling you, the, the visual space and the motor space start to connect. And this is where this loop starts or the updating loop actually start to happen between those two spaces. And more importantly, I put three arrow here because I think what's driving uh, this updating really happens on this part of the loop. It's like it's really the reaching pattern that is actually influencing the seeing pattern where the updating is taking place. You can look at the matching rate uh, in those responses. That's, that's the same data, but just represented a little bit differently. If you think that the baby is looking here, been reaching here, that would be a no match. If they're looking here and reaching here, here you have a match, just like you saw for the nine months old video I showed you. And here are those three babies. And you can see that all three increase their match over time. This one was non significant due for, for this first data point, but if you remove that, you have a significant increase here. And interestingly, they all end up in five weeks of reaching experience to where the, uh, the nine months old are, which are right here. We were just really astounded because all you hear is that babies take that long to learn to reach, but based on the, this data and the eye tracking and this measure, they were not very different. So we concluded that vision aligns to reaching and not the reverse as saw before. And that suggests that babies may have a strong proprioceptive sense uh, of their movement when they come into this reaching task. And again, kind of, this is how it happens. Okay, so our explanation again, just to set up the next step we saw that infants, maybe they acquire this body center sense of movement direction through their limb movement in the months before reach onset. There is history. They must be doing something before that 
actually bring them to, to doing seizures when they, when they start. And so when reaching emerges, infants learn to map their looking behavior into the field of their movements, just like I showed you. But we wanted to understand more what's going on. What do they do before in those, in those weeks and months before they start to reach? So this is where we started to go back in time and looking at those infants before they start to reach. We saw that maybe reach onset and its proprioceptive origin can be better understood by watching infants' spontaneous activity in their first months of life. What's happening during those months? And so during wake times, infants, we know they move a lot. And I can show you this video here. This is a three weeks old baby. She, her eyes are closed, but she's moving a lot. So they touch their body in varied ways. And the most important thing, they do this in complete absence of visual control. So I think what happens during those weeks before reach onset is that they gain a lot of haptic and proprioceptive motor experience that actually really is, is, is handy for them to start to direct their hand in space. All this happened in their personal space, but in those data, and I'll show you more, um, infants rarely look at the hand. And now I could, we could never see, we followed those baby weekly, we could never see scenes where they would look at their hand. I think they do that later, but not during that early period. So for this work, we wanted to establish a number of things. We wanted to be able to document infant movement history in the early months of life. We wanted to identify the general typical pattern of movement activity. We wanted to capture the range of natural proprioceptive experience that those infants would get. We wanted to understand how they explore their body in the surrounding space, in their peripersonal space, and eventually try to delineate an infant's early movement vocabulary. What are they doing? So I think that all these components are really critical to the emergence of goal-directed reaching around three to five months of age, in a way that they need that in order to go in reaching. When we reach for target, we don't look at our hand because we know our body. We know how our hand can actually reach a place in space. And I think this is what those babies are learning. And so this is what we define. These are the experiences that we think constitute this proprioceptive origin of infant reaching. So this work is still in progress and I can give you only a snapshot of some of the things that we have done so far and there's still a lot that we need to work on. But again, just to give you a background, we, we use a microgenetic study. Uh, we actually recruited those infants before they were born and we have some prenatal data that I, we haven't looked at yet. But the idea, so we have these five infants, we followed them every week they came to the lab up to the time they were about 10 or 13 weeks of age. And, and the end point is when they were starting to control their head. And uh, we observe in different conditions. So here you have a baseline condition where um, there is nothing around. Uh, we had all the environment, we, we, we sort of remove all these tractors. Here we have a toe in view condition. So and for each one of those conditions, we measured five minutes of, of, of spontaneous activity, right? So these are our five condition. And so we have quite a lot of kinematic recording here to make those analyses. We have a lot of data. And when those infants reach to the head control, we move them into our eye tracking paradigm. And so these are the five infants we're currently analyzing to see if they would reproduce the pat pattern that I showed you uh, before, but we're not there yet. And we recorded the kinematic so we can do some, some analysis. So I'm just going to show you just a few findings about this work. Um, so we analyzed the touches behavior first because the touches allowed us to segment those continuous kinematic recordings into moments, moments of touches and moments of the hand moving in space. And so, and then we could analyze the kinematic as a function of those moments. I need to uh, acknowledge my two graduate students, Abby Gale and John Connell, because they're the one who devised this coding and they spend enormous hours coding those videos um, frame by frame to identify where um, those babies' hand would touch the body or surrounding surface. What they did, they, they divided the body in 20 areas. Um, the odd number correspond to the left side, the even number on the right side, and three generally defined um, floor areas. And from this, what I'll show you today um, is, is we derive the number of touches that those infant performs in those times and the relative time when the end was moving in the air. And I'll show you a little bit of the kinematics as well. Okay, I'm gonna start with the touch. This is only for two conditions, the baseline and the point view. You have the ages right here from three to about 13 weeks. 
Um, and here the, is the data for the three babies, the average and the standard deviation. Now, if you look at this data in five minute condition baseline or 10 minutes if you had them both together, those babies touch enormously. Like you have about a hundred touches. They're there almost all the time, almost every week. And so if you take those number and you add them together in 10 minutes, you have 200 touches. If you continue and do the math, just to for an estimate, in 20 minutes, they will perform 436 touches. In one hour, that corresponds to 1,300 touches. And I can continue, like five hours, we have 5,241 touches. And so you take this every day, every time a wake hour during the day, from three weeks and even before to the time that 13, you have a zillion touches that those infants are doing on their body and on the surrounding surface. And I'm not showing this data, but the analysis show that they touch every part of the bodies that their hand can go to. So it's not that they focus just on one area. And in fact, some of the data we look at, they're not focused on the face or the mouse, like it's been believed for a long time. They actually touch their toe more than anything else, but they touch every part of the body they can reach to. So they really are exploring their surrounding proprioceptively and haptically without visual control. So imagine the experience that this, this actually uh, represents. Imagine being blind and you don't have vision and you're gonna rely on haptic and touch and, and proprioception to, to coordinate the movement. I think this is what those babies are doing. So I wanna come back to those two spaces, those two sensory spaces, because again, during this period, I think there are a lot of other things that develop, right? We know that when they're born, Acuity, you know, in the first two months of life, develop really, really fast. Depth perception develops, visual attention develops. And so you have a loop here that is going on, but I think it's within the realm of the visual system. And then you have the motor activity that they do. And again, they don't really cross with one another. This is the percentage of time that they spent touching their body, the floor, or the air. And so you can see uh, about 50% of the time is actually touching. These are touch to the body. These are touches to the floor. That's about 25% for each one of them. And the other 50% is actually in the air. When the ends are in the air, moving from one place to the other. So they're moving also. And uh, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, of a of a sense of what, of what this movement looked like. So here are, is a display, a MATLAB display of uh, the kinematics that they performed. This is only for the baseline condition. And when you can see here, the blue uh, spaghettis are the movement that the, that the right hand did in this five minute recording, continuous recording. Here you have the left hand in magenta. And just orient yourself a little bit, the head is back here the waist is about here. And this movement is actually one segment of one movement that I can show you here that correspond to that. So you can see that this baby is starting from behind the head. There is a little loop in the air and then she ends up here in the, in a, in a, in a torso. So again, these movements you will see are extremely varied. Here are just a few examples of those movements for the right and the left hand. Some start from the floor and go to the body. Some start to one area of the body and return there. Some actually go to short distance, but some go to long distance. Some are extremely convoluted trajectories. Same thing for the other hand. And if you add all the touches I was telling you, that's as many movement they do proprioceptively in space, just moving around. So they really gain a lot of proprioceptive and motor experience. So, Again, I wanna show you, these are 10 months old babies. I love showing my babies. <laughs> so you can see even at 10 months, they look and they move, but in parallel, right? They, they still touch, they, the head looks around, they're more alert. Uh, they're 10 months old here, uh, 10, yeah, 10 weeks old, sorry. Um, and they move, but there's really crossing of those two things. So again, so there is this really two, two separate spaces that I think are experienced in parallel. So when do we see this visual and motor system or those two spaces crossing? Well, in my view, it happens at which onset. And again, I wanna show you some wonderful recording that were done by uh, one of my former graduate student, Joshua Williams, 
who followed babies during the transition every day. So he had a 16 days follow up of those infants when they were about two and a half months. And uh, I wanna show you, this is what happens in one of those babies on the first day of the session. One thing that you can see is how focused on the object this infant is. And he's moving his arm, just some grasping, apparently grasping movement, but actually never manages to touch the toy. Seems like it takes a lot of effort <laughs> to get their hand there. And that's one minute recording and he hardly quits. So maybe you can say he wants the toy. Again, I'm not sure. Maybe they're just, you know, excited to see something close to them. It's not clear. This object is in the peripersonal space of that infant where they clearly brought their hand before, but the connection is not there. So again, there are those two spaces that actually even there are present. I'm gonna show you another, sorry, to shift that. this is another one because I thought maybe this is what Piaget saw when he came with a visual guided uh, hypothesis when, uh, in, his, in his days. This is typical of what some other infants have done as well. So same focus on the object. and their shift focus on the hand. And from that time, it seems that the object is out of sight. They forget the hands become more interesting. But here you have the first connection. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> I wanted to do that. You know, I put this little arrow. This is maybe where some connection between the visual space and the motor space is starting to come in. It's still not visual guidance a la Piaget because in this case, this baby never managed to hit the toy, but suddenly there is, you know, they realize there is a hand there. Okay, I'm just gonna let this play again to the end. So again, hard to know if it's trying to reach or what, what they're doing, but other babies also shifted the focus on their hands and then... Okay, so... Um, yeah, so this is another infant. So as I was saying, babies... Um, Josh was following those babies for 16 days in a row. And this is day six of this infant. So for six days in the study, he has never managed to touch the target. And here is trial three of day six, where the first contact with the object occurs. It's a much shorter video, but I'm gonna let you see what, what happens. So here she's a little bit phased out, two trials where she was not successful. She tend to lose a little bit of attention. And that she looked startled. Oh my gosh, what's happening there? I'm just going to play this again because it's really short. She clearly did not expect this, right? <laughs> okay. So this is the kind of moment where I'm thinking there's a lot of happening. First, that maybe there is not a clear goal in mind. It happens by chance. But when it happens, it's suddenly that it triggers a light in this baby's mind. That's like suddenly, oh, what happened here? Interesting. And what in this in this um, setup, uh, Josh has sort of uh, augmented the result. You, you, you could hear the bell start to move, and there is a sound. So a lot of things are happening when this touch occurs. Oops, sorry. 
So again, there is no visual guidance of the hand, the contact seems to happen by chance. And it looks in this case like the infant got startled, like he's just surprised. But what happened next? I'll show you trial four in this infant. So again, I think this is where the loop is sort of starting to get established. So this is trial four. She's now completely focused on the object and she hit it. And in fact, for the next three trial, she made successful contact. So once infant start to make this first contact, as I said, things change. And the updating I was telling you just happened very quickly. Here are two studies that Josh has conducted with those infants over the 16 day period. So they started here with zero reaching and you have different condition. I'm not gonna go into detail. I'm happy to explain this uh, if, if you're curious about this, but, but here were two interventions. These are group control. They didn't have experience in between. So here were sticky and non-sticky mittens. Uh, infants, these one were in the contingent paradigm that I showed you on the video. In the contingent paradigm, if you look at the scale, it goes up to 60 and only to 40 here. This is where you observe the strongest learning process, right? This was in the contingent right here. Um, so once they do this, those infants completely change their behavior. Now the connection is established. And I think really what's happening in that moment, there's a confluence of haptic information that actually serves as a contingent reinforcement during the contact while they are looking. Uh, again, the multi-sensory process is right there at that moment. And it seems to play a major role in, in, in trying to get those infants to reproduce this interesting effect. I was talking to Brad early about how this reinforcement or reinforcement learning can actually have very powerful effect, especially during contingency in infants. There's a lot of studies are showing how contingency is a really effective um, motivator to get those infants to, to do more and, and actually start this loop and update their, their response pattern. Okay, so I started this talk here by telling you about the complexity and I sort of went back in time. And so I wanted, I would like to, to recap a little bit what I told you uh, today uh, by starting here at birth. I haven't mentioned much about birth um, because well, I haven't done any study right at birth, but there is a lot of literature <laughs> suggesting that at birth, maybe the senses are sort of uh, intimately coupled, uh, but they're also indifferentiated. Um, and so this coupling that can be observed between perception and action in the reflexes, for example, if you, if you stimulate the cheek, they turn their head. If you put pressure on their hand, they grasp. And there are even studies, for example, from uh, Marianne Babu Ross, who put those really newborn babies in, in optic flow fields and they start to step in the air. And so there's a lot of response that seem to be automatic response pre-programmed that actually get to start the system, but they're very rudimentary responses. What happens next, I think, and I'm not set on this idea, but that's dictated by what my observation at this point is that there are those two sensory spaces that form. So vision develops, motor develops, but in very different spaces. Vision is really far, far and distant. You can see things far away as I quickly develop those baby can, their space is much bigger than their personal space that is limited to the length of their arms, right? And so again, during this time, I think those two things happen, happen in parallel and they're not really, really connected. Reach onset is really the moment where those two things start to align and those loops start to happen. And you can see the increasing touch is very rapid. So I think the onset of reaching is really a key period in development where the two space are starting to get connected, where there is a lot of start of multi-sensory inputs coming in it's very simple because it's seeing and touching. There is no grasp at this point. They're not, they're not, there's clearly more development that needs to happen. But at this point, there is also probably the emergence of goal and the sense of self-agency that now they can start to act on the environment and do things while before they were just sort of observer what was going on. And then clearly those things sort of uh, get more and more detailed. And I told you here that those things can take a lot of time. Those, those integration at this level may take a lot of time, a lot of repetition, um, but I think multi-sensory integration here is very essential uh, in this process to happen. But really it does not stop here. Uh, development continues. And I just wanted to finish by 
showing you three examples of things that I've done with my uh, graduate student by taking this theme and seeing how we could apply it to other behavior. Here is a work that Rebecca Wiener did. Uh, she was really curious to see how infants discover non-obvious obvious properties of objects uh, by manipulation. And so she did eye tracking on social. She would present in those pair of objects that you have here. One is visually interesting. It's got all those details. The other one is not, but this one is filled. So if they manipulate this one as interesting properties after they have in hand. So with eye tracking, she could identify where they looked first on which object they fixed it first where the most looked happened to be, and then where the contact, what was the first object they reached for, and then what kind of manipulation they did. And so for the dotted object that was visually interesting, you can see there is a strong link between the first fixation and the most look. But once it's get into their hand with the contact, then the link sort of weakened. Um, the other, the fill object, didn't have a strong link from first fixation to most look. But once they touched it and they started to manipulate it, that's where the strong link sort of happened. So clearly at 11 months old, infants are able to differentiate those things and actually modulate their response. Here's work from uh, Abigail, who uh, was influenced by some work that Chen Yu and Linda Smith did on, on the influence of motor exploration on, on um, object and label mapping. She created three conditions with novel objects that you can see here and novel label like one object, for example, this one was called Dobu. And she had three conditions. So one was the vision on condition, the typical condition that you use for teaching words to infants. You, know, you, you point at the apple and say, apple, see the apple. So she did that with the Dobu. Here is a Dobu, see the Dobu. Can you tell it's a Dobu? But those babies never got to manipulate the object, they only got to see it, and she was doing eye tracking during that time. And then she had two other conditions where she actually allowed the infant to manipulate the object, either after they would see and hear the label like here, and then they would get to reach, manipulate, and do things with it, or they would actually hear the label only after uh, they would manipulate the object. When you look at the test trial that she did here with a distractor, the condition, the look only condition, infant looked more at the, the distractor than the object. So they say, where is the dobu here? They would not look at the dobu. They would look more at the distractor. But in the two condition where they actually had manipulation, motor activity that was paired with the label, you can see they looked more at the target object than, in, than the distractor. So the idea here again that motor activity and exploration is not just discovering the feature of the object, but they also may serve as a, actually a, a um, a pass to learning things and pairing things and associating things like the label of, of an object in this case. And finally, I want to tell you a little bit about pilot work that was done by John Connell, another graduate student of mine. He was interested in tool use and uh, seeing how demonstrating the use of those objects, like this, we call this one the drumstick, uh, how that could influence their looking and manipulation pattern. So we started with a baseline trials, and what we know from prior study with nine months old is that they look a lot here and they reach a lot here. Um, and actually I showed you that on the, on the prior slide. So the lighter gray are the area where they look more at the, at the head versus the handle. And you can see that's where the first fixation is. And then they look a lot there also, but these are repeated trial. And so sometimes they go to the handle and then the contact and the manipulation is that mostly at the handle. After a few baseline trials, I started to introduce the demonstration. So what he did, it actually, the object appeared in the theater, it does eye tracking as well, he grabbed the handle and he struck the object just a few times on the plate. So it also had the sound and he was tracking where the object were looking during the demonstration. And then they had the object in hand and they looked what they did. So you can see there's a same change in the fixation uh, and goes to the handle more. So you have more dark spot here. You still have more dark spot here after the second demonstration. And the third one on this infant, this, this infant actually changed here uh, and they returned back to the head. And so um, this again was pilot work, but I just wanted to bring this as an illustration of the kind of things that can be brought in to try to understand the sequence and the learning process trial after trial after the behavior is sort of changing over time. So anyway, um, I don't wanna take more of your time. Uh, I'm gonna wrap up here. Uh, thank you for listening.
Uh, just put those pictures because again, I think uh, infants really learn a lot from their motor and exploratory behavior in the world. Um, and it's not just at birth, it's just later and even later on when they learn to eat. I think those are really important um, things that infants uh, need to have. And we're talking about COVID where a lot of those things go removed. Um, and I think that we clearly need to put the action back into, into the life of those, those kids. Thank you very much. Well, hi. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. Uh, thank you for this and sharing your work. Uh, the, the video of the startle, of course, that's, that was really entertaining and interesting to see. But it reminded me that the startle response is uh, mediated through the amygdala. And through a fairly simple uh, motor pathway, Right through the brainstem, and uh, it's got me wondering if you've ever collected EEG telling these infants, and whether you could use EEG um, to predict um, any of the motor responses or the trajectory of the development. Yeah, so it's very difficult to do EEG where infant this young. So those were two and a half months, and the 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 EEG response also very noisy. They're not so clean. It's very difficult. We tried to do that with a colleague and we have not been able to, to get that. We are trying now to do a study like that with seven months or so seven months a little older using FNIRS uh, to try to see if we can identify also the different pathway. We're looking mostly at the, the, the prefrontal and the parietal lobe to see if there are any change in activation um, as, they, as they reach for objects. But I, I don't have any results really to, to share this one. Yeah, that, that moment became a very salient moment for that. Yeah. Uh, well, right. So there was this uh, like almost a fear response that an emotional memory was planted there, right? That may have facilitated, you know, the future uh, graphs or yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I kind of agree, and I, I wish I could capture that. I yeah. think that yeah, yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm doing part of the can, I, I'm not sure I heard you. Oh, so the robotics work, yes. Um, well, the so the, this I'm not doing the robotic works. I'm just providing the data, uh, but I'm collaborating with a group in the uh, in, um, in, um, Republic of Czechoslovakia where they are doing studies on the discovery of the self in robots using IQ, but also other type of robots. And so the work I was showing where we recorded all this really long uh, kinematic of movement and touches uh, are actually presently used by those researcher to try to uh, get those robots to get a sense of their body. So again, the idea is that when you move, you move because you know your body, right? You can move your arm, I know it's extended. I don't need to look at it because I have all those sensors that actually tell my brain uh, how my limbs are in space. Um, and so they're trying to teach robots to get to that point. And this particular group of researchers do this fascinating work where they actually model uh, the body part in the somatosensory cortex where they put, they feed those robots with, uh, with uh, sense, sensing cells. And so they, if you go and stimulate, let's say a cell here in the, in the arm, it actually on the software that actually represents the, the body actually lights up right in that area. And so if they do two areas, let's say they touch here and here at the same time, you can see those two area lighting up. And by doing that, they actually learn, I taught the robot, like if I'm touching here and I remove my hand, can the robot use this other hand to go and touch there? And so, so far they've been successful in doing this. But that's also very limited, you know, they're more to movement than just that. So that's one of the, the areas, trying to um, get those robots to build an image of their body and self to see how it actually can be contributing to their motor learning. It's important. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Crosstalk between their visual, auditory, and other systems in their brain, kind of similar to individuals with synesthesia. And I was wondering, is that play a role in any of your work? Because you know, you see these babies looking at these objects, but is that only lighting up areas in their visual cortex, or are they still learning what that 
sensory information is where it should be mapped to. Um, you mean mapped to the movement or mapped to the brain? Or? Uh, not my area of expertise, but <laughs> I've read some work that indicates essentially like when you play music up for an adult, it lights up auditory areas mm. of your brain and you look at something, get visual stimulation, adult, it relates to very specific areas of your brain. However, in babies, they might be staring at a visual object and their auditory sensory areas of their brain are, excuse my naivete, lighting up. And yeah. so I was wondering if you think that can play any of the roles in you know, integrating the movement with the confusing sensory information. So clearly the visual center respond to visual stimulation, even in newborn. Um, there is some work also regarding to the body from Peter Marshall and uh, Andrew Meltzoff who have designed this very clever study where they, so they use an EG cap in those infants. I don't know how they managed to do this. And I can't remember, I think the youngest infants they did that were about four months old, where they stimulate, you know, is with a feather finger, this part, and they could see activation in the somatosensory cortex that was actually mapped, could have mapped to that. And so the idea is that they already have a body representation in the brain. And they did that also with the foot, and they did that with the mouse and the mouse, they got an even stronger response because that's a highly sensitive area. Um, so based on these results, it seems to suggest that they have some representation of their body, but that's the somatosensory cortex. Yeah. If you go into the motor cortex, just next to it, but it's not exactly the same. That's the one that matters in generating movement. And so it's not clear again, how those two things are connected or mapping onto each other. And that's probably something that needs to develop a while to create those connections. And again, I don't know any research that has really looked at that. I think the, the best work that I can think of is uh, the, the Marshall and, and, and Metzl work, but it's only one part of the story. So it'll be very interesting to see um, how those two things come together. So, Paul Calloway has done the work on feet. I just wondered if you would speculate on the, of course, the feet are not touching the body. Yeah. But whether or not you would suggest that there's a different pathway to how you reach for objects with your feet. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> I should ask you how we. I, I mean, my. My sense is that the feet are a little easier to control than the, the arms, just because the arms have many more degrees of freedom. Um, and so in that study with Esther Thielen, the objects were right down, you know, next to their feet. And so, you know, they kick and they hit something. Um, so maybe that's why they reach with their feet before they do it with their hands. Uh, I'm not sure if their study was actually showing that they were actually looking at the targets. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, maybe again, if they hit with their foot and they hit a target and, and they're very good proprioceptive and haptic, you know, sense, they can do this again and again without looking if they know where that thing is in space. So actually that would be a really good control and something we're planning to do to see if those babies actually can get to one place over and over, uh, even before they reach. But that would be my best answer to that at this point. I don't know the answer. I was just up. <laughs> yeah. My other question is a follow up to a sort of John Jacob question, which is, of course, you know, it's not just proprioception, it's somatosensation, which is touch, mm -hmm. our proprioceptors, and our vestibular system. I wonder what, whether you think about putting children in different positions of this upper, in other words, how mm -hmm. that would affect the whole system. And you know, I always encourage mothers to turn their children upside down. So yeah. lots of vestibular stimulation. So I wondered whether or not that would play into your mapping you know, the body you know and the way in which you interact. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and I don't know the answer. It's, I mean, that would be, you know, clearly the, we only observe those infants in supine. That's the way we wanted to start to look at them because that's how they spend most of their time, you know, every day they're in their crib most of the time at that age in supine. 
And so we wanted to put them in a condition as natural as possible to try to capture what they would eventually do at home. Um, but yeah, I mean, new, new position would be really interesting to look at and see how they manage. Because clearly, I mean, I can extend my arm here, but I can lay down and extend my arm. It's always, my arm is always extended regardless of my body general posture, whether those babies can do that. I don't know, but that's a really good question. Yeah. Uh, really So I have not done any work with special population at this point. Um, the work that was showing you on the self-touch um, got us into a lot of direction and particularly people actually are looking at preterm infants. And so the idea, and I, I don't know the data yet because this is still data that is into work, but uh, there's a German group who study a lot of infants and they do a lot of analysis on the, the general movement pattern. And they wanted to compare how that actually affect also the touching pattern in those preemies. And they use some of our babies as a control, as a control group. Um, and so the idea here is that often babies who are born preterm, they may be, be delayed into their motor developments. And so the idea was to see, they, do they touch their body as much or less? Does it really matter? I mean, that's a super interesting question. And we also got data from Ayan Barbuas, who sent us some of our coding that we're currently coding. They're also uh, born uh, preterm infants, uh, but I don't have the, I don't have, I don't have any results, but I mean, this is something that we're starting to look into. I guess my, 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 yeah, we, it's very hard to recruit that kind of population where I'm at. Um, I think that's a really, really good question, but I, I, I think I let other ones do, <laughs> do that part because it, it would be very difficult to recruit that population. But thanks for the question. That data was collected in 2000. So I just, these were the first studies that I, that I did. And so it would be hard. We could try to do the study again and follow, follow them up. I think that's a really excellent question. But yeah. Yes. I'm struck by the videos you have that you use language to find positions and moving around and theoretically learning a lot from their different mm -hmm. Like what you hear is the recommendations of what you should do with your child with the type of change. <laughs> Specifically, with the supine position being recommended to reduce SID, and simultaneously, with this recommendation to swallow that baby so they don't starve themselves to sleep. Do you think there is some ramifications of wrapping a child up tightly on the night when they're not undergoing these spontaneous movements? <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, it is something that only changed in the last, what, 15, 10 years, the recommendation went from, from on their belly to on their back. Yeah. <laughs> you might have read it more than 17 years. That's all right. So yeah. maybe it was 20 years ago. Do you think that developmentally, like, I could be convinced that those movements are important. <laughs> I am stopping them. That's a, a yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, the year that I met Rodolphe and Aspa, there was a student of uh, Jackie Goodway, and I can't remember which country she's from. When I, the poster I was, uh, that Rodolf sort of mentioned, she came and she looked at it and said, oh, I wonder what happened with those babies if they're swaddled, because we do that in my country. So, and she was like all concerned about, you know, what are we doing to our babies? 
And she said she was going to follow up uh, with me to try to do that and collect data. I unfortunately never heard back from her, uh, which I would have loved because I think this is really the kind of question that we should we should try to go after to understand what is the meaning of this self touch really does it really matter for development um we don't right now all we have is what we've done um and so it would be really great to 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 expand that to other population to see how that works but yeah so but great question yeah it's yeah it's culturally defined I mean, here we swaddle baby at night. I mean, there was all studies, and Jane Clark can probably attest to that. Were done by uh, was that Dennis and Dennis, or they went and looked at babies swaddled in uh, Hopi, uh, yeah, and they were finding that uh, those babies uh, were actually not. They, they they took the onset of walking at their at their developmental marker, and that the babies who were swaddled were not different than the babies who were not swaddled. Our, that study is mm -hmm. not well cited, like the fact that those babies were off those swaddle boards. Off. Yeah, exactly. So, That's where so I was going. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But there was another study done in China. It was not the swaddle board where they actually kept those babies on the sandbag for a very protracted period, like up to two month, two years old. Um, they were keeping their kids in there where they have restricted uh, mobility. And those kids were showing delay in uh, locomotor skills. So again, it's just what, what Jane was saying, it depends on the period, but if you give them free time during the day, that seems to be enough to prevent the delay to, to take place, luckily for those kids. <laughs> yeah. So when I was a graduate student here in 1985, I had the pleasure of being in a class which asked me to write a review book. So of course I did, and I chose the development of eye hand coordination for mm -hmm. infants. And I ended up using Bushnell's work and the film for like a range of different things. So I came up with the same sort of stages that Bushnell says. Started off with visually elicited reaching, mm -hmm. um, and that's the experiment with Bauer and maybe sort of from Huston and various infants through glass with brightly colored and they tend to swipe out with it. Yeah. So that was a visually elicited. Mm -hmm. and the next stage was visually guided, mm -hmm. which I've since learned, <laughs> but he wasn't right. And then the last stage was, of course, visually elicited in the sense that you would have reached something you could see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's also um, you know, visually guided as well, meaning it's feedback. Yeah. So your work taught me is tough that I've been teaching this for years and years. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say visually guided. Yeah. Um, so I thank you for that. <laughs> and I would say visually. Yeah. <laughs> so my, my question actually is back to the visually elicited. Mm -hmm. So do you think that um, it swipes in the first four months of life are visually or can be visually elicited or not? Is that is that wrong as well? Do you mean swipes on the object? Well, um, no. I'm thinking of the, the Bowers work where you know, yeah, you have know, things mm -hmm. that there is age range and they would tend to swipe out more closely okay. through to where the ball was, or whatever it was. And then Von Hofstein's work where he, you know, anything that was stationary, mm -hmm. the babies didn't actually sort of reach the ball, whereas if it was moving and, and brightly colored, they tended to swipe it. So, Maybe, although there was some visual elicitation, I guess, elicitation <laughs> of the movement. So, what you're talking is about newborn, right? The pre-reaching well, response. Four months, visually yeah. So von Neufton did one of the best studies so far, where it was showing that you know those babies initially they do those movements are adverse, but there is a lot of debate about whether that's really elicited or what, um, because von Neufton was finding that if found as many arm extension with an object or no object. So they, they would do those response. And uh, one explanation is that there is this neck and arm connection. And that in those studies, they keep the head at midline with a with little thing that maintain the head. And when that happens, you know, if they push a little bit this way or this way, I don't know, that could sort of trigger those responses. So that would be an alternate explanation. So it's, it's not clear. Um, but then indeed a follow-up analysis where it was looking at those babies when the object was present, 
This data suggested that on those cases, they were bringing their hand closer to the target. So again, it's it's not very clear, you know, because they do as much with or without, but when you have it, they maybe bring the hand a little closer. But when you follow those infants over time, he actually observed this separation that I was kind of talking about. In fact, he was looking at the hand opening and finding that around seven weeks old, those babies don't do this full arm and hand extension, which you observe in the newborn. You still have an arm extension, but it's fisted, and they actually don't look at the object so much anymore. So it's not clear how the motor response and the visual response actually go together. And after that, we get into this the spirit before the reach onset where they seem to get ready for that. And you can see the hand opening happening again and more look at the object, a little bit like you saw in those video. So it's it's kind of a complicated pattern. Um, and it's not, it's not clear what is visually elicited early on. Yeah. <laughs> I love that work actually, the phone of Jensen is really, really, really nice work. I'm just asking basically about the Pavela if, if she knows if this, this lady here, they have all the siblings or not. Because I'm wondering if the students of all the siblings may count to so influence the So the a lot of them did. But our samples are so small because we do this micro genetic, you know, we really look at them very closely. And so I know we don't have a lot of power because we're more interested in the processes and really just looking at the fine detail. But for those kind of questions, it's really hard to say the inference of the sibling because we really need a lot bigger sample to be able to tell, you know, the sibling, the kids with sibling or no sibling, are they developing differently? So I know their influence paper on walking that kids who have siblings, uh, they tend to walk earlier because they're clearly influenced by the, by the siblings. Um, but I think that's, that's the only, do you, do you know other work that would suggest that? Yeah, so I'm reaching, I don't know, yeah. But it raised the question you mentioned the Delta before, and I was thinking about when you looked at their, you know, the sort of is that they imitated who imitated the reach, mm -hmm. did they reach? Yeah. Because I'll stick their tongue out if I stick my tongue. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I the yeah. Time the baby, I, got I know. <laughs> yes, I, I did that with my daughter. So I was just like, yes. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I don't know. But that, yeah. But it kind of goes to the siblings. Yeah. 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 So I'm wondering if we can take this, this knowledge and this information about how we originally learned to reach and organize our reaching and grasping, if that would apply to a mature brain after a stroke or some sort of trauma and we learn. And we've got the patterns there, but the pattern is disrupted somehow. Yep. Would this, you think this would inform, if we can figure it out on your end, could we get it done on our end? So I'm not an expert in rehabilitation, but I find it feel very fascinating. So I want to know how I kind of take okay. a peek. And one, one study that I remember very well is that to rehabilitate, those patients need a lot of intensive motor training. And so I remember one task was to actually take uh, like little cones from one part to the other and you put a weight on the good end so to make sure they don't use the good, the valid end. But it's, it's a lot of practice. It's a really intense training. And, you know, in a way I can see a parallel with those babies doing all those touches. They're doing intense training. Um, and so I think the brain maybe needs that when there's been, you know, sort of an insult that actually affected the, the network and the connections that to recreate those connections. And again, that's a good example where the motor actually feeds back into the brain. I was talking about this with Brad earlier. 
uh, where you know that's how the, the brain strive by using our body and you know taking what it can from the body and it could be good or bad because we can get bad habits as well and the brain will <laughs> will pick up on those um, but you know for rehabilitation I think that's absolutely essential but I don't think it's necessarily involving visual manual coordination I think it's just rehabilitating the motor loss. Mm -hmm. Just follow up on that. Uh, there are studies which have shown that if the patient does have sensory hearing, then they are learned good learning to right. Um, so that goes into what yeah. No, just top of it. Okay, so I think we're gonna, we're gonna stop here. So thanks again, Daniela, for uh, listening to your speaker today. So thank you very much. The last round of applause. <laughs> you know, for those who are, because a few minutes for the stay here and after just for more lab visits today. So we still have about 20 minutes, basically, some people want to have a. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.